quorum. So yeah, why don't we start, um, start the roll call? Okay. Uh, Mike? I am here. Great. <coughs> Leslie? Here. Great. Uh, Joe Barr? Here. Great. Uh, Jill? Here. Great. Natasha? Here. Marvin? Is absent. Uh, Jim? Here. Great. And then I have Joe Conley. I don't... He wasn't going to be able to join us, I believe. Okay. And then uh, Clear Flair? Ricker? I see her. You're muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're muted. I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I wasn't looking at your face. I'm so sorry. I was looking That's all at right. the other part and I'm like, she's oh. here. I see her. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Sure. Sorry for the confusion. So uh, absent is just Marvin and Joe Conley. So um, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Yes. And I think uh, Marvin will be at, rejoining us at the next meeting. He's never he's never left the work. He's just uh, not been able to attend our last few meetings. So correct. Um, so uh, we are meeting on June uh, June <laughs> January uh, wishful 30th, thinking Tuesday January thirtieth twenty twenty four. I wish it was June. It would be much nicer. Um, so uh, and this is a uh, meeting of the Artif Arlington Artificial Turf Study Committee, and we have a quorum. So uh, first item would be uh, approval of the minutes. I hope everyone's had a chance to look at them and I'm struggling with my computer right now to, um, to pull up the minutes. Um, Natasha, you wanna say anything about them while people maybe give them a quick look? I, if I could just jump in, I, I, once again, I just wanna note how complete and thorough and well-written those minutes are. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> and uh, the other part of it is that I think it's very important to read some of the attachments that people have sent in the public comments, because some of those documents are really quite helpful. And with that, I will recommend we approve the minutes as presented. Yes. Sorry, I'm still... Uh, <laughs> there it is. Okay. Uh, Learn a valuable oh, yeah. lesson. I, I should have, like I always do, I should have downloaded this before uh, the agenda, before the meeting. But um, I did review the minutes. So is there a motion? I moved. Is there so a we've got a motion second. from Mike. We, thank you, Jill. Okay. Okay. All those uh, in favor, we'll go right down the list. So Mike? Yes. Okay. Leslie? Abstain. Abstain. Uh, Joe Barr? Yep. Uh, Jill? Yes. Okay. Natasha? Yes. Um, Marvin is not present. And Jim? Yes. Okay. Motion. Yeah. Uh, the meeting minutes are approved. Natasha does a great job with this, <laughs> and I'm so glad she is the, the committee secretary. Um, I try. Jack of, jack of all trades. I but please, <laughs> I welcome any feedback and any edits, so... Well, you know, I think that most helpful thing about the minutes is, you know, we do have people who attend the meetings and listen, but, uh, and follow what we're doing attentively. But to be honest, probably a lot of people who are interested in what we're doing don't have the opportunity to do the scheduling or other reasons. And so if they have nothing else but the minutes, I mean, we know we have the recordings too, but if they had nothing but the minutes, I think they'd get a very, um, accurate picture of our conversations and our progress so um that's the hallmark of good minutes so thank you <laughs> well I, I do think that these the you know once this report goes to town meeting that they the process of the committee may be you know subject to a fair amount of scrutiny so i think having <laughs> thorough minutes is, and we is welcome important. it and we welcome it joe we welcome yeah. it but i think it's important you know natasha's doing a great job and yeah. i think it's particularly yeah. important i like on the capital planning committee that i'm, I'm on I'm not sure if too many people actually go back and look at our minutes. Um, and I was recording secretary for four years, so I took I tried to take thorough minutes, but yeah. so I know how hard it is. But I think this will probably get a little more scrutiny. So for sure, for sure, as well our recordings. And you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I I um and I do think we will probably get more interest in our meetings as we get further down the path the next two or three weeks in terms of um of um, 
you know, progress made and as we start to sort of come to terms with some actual recommendations potentially. Uh, so uh, correspondence received, Natasha, any, wanna give us the quick rundown on that? Sure, so we have um, four pieces of correspondence that we've received. Um, We've got one email from Susan Chapnick. It was in regards to the human health and environmental concerns, um, particularly the investigation of PFAS. Uh, second email from Susan Chapnick, um, bringing the attention to a natural grass playing field study, case study out of Springfield. Um, the third from Susan Chapnick was um, attention to the cost table from the meeting materials from uh, January 23rd, and I believe she was looking for some clarification. Um, and the fourth email was from Clarissa Rowe, um, town meeting member, as well as uh, architect, uh, sorry, landscape architect, um, just with um, her, her thoughts and concerns about artificial turf. Um, so those are the meeting minutes. There were some supporting materials that were in the attachments as well. All of that's been provided. Uh, so at this point, point. Um, happy to discuss. I would be happy to address um, the human health and environmental concerns and the investigation of, of PFAS. Um, so our group is definitely looking at not just PFAS, but a lot of other chemical materials we've just chosen not, uh, sorry, chemicals and, and compounds. Um, we've just chosen not to necessarily discuss that here at this point, only because um, all of that's going to come out into our conversation and our discussion with the report. So um, all of the updates to date have tried to be very brief, but it is not to say that we're not discussing um, these important topics. So I, I just did want to provide clarification with that. Um, and I think that's all I really have to say right now. Yeah, I'll make a few comments in addition to that. And just following on that comment, you know, yes, for those who are wondering, we're going to be addressing PFAS. <laughs> the safety group, we have not been looking at that because that's not doesn't really fit into our picture or our piece. But I'm guessing health and environmental are definitely taking a look at PFAS. And are anyone worried we're going to have a PFAS free report? Uh, don't don't worry, we will address that issue. Um, the other comment I had is just, um, I want to just clarify two things when people submit comment, and we welcome it, and I read all of it, and it's generally very helpful, even if I don't agree with it, it's generally very helpful, and more often than not, I agree with it. Um, but two things. Uh, first, if someone's going to submit um, something to um, to make a certain point. Um, I just would hope that they would do the research necessary to make sure that the point they're trying to prove is actually true. Um, so if someone says, you know, such and such town does not have any artificial turf fields, that's fine. I, I just would hope that they would make sure that that's an accurate statement and that what they're providing us accurately reflects that that town has no artificial turf fields. In some cases, we received things where on a simple Google search, it quickly became clear that the town did have artificial turf fields, you know, so people are free to submit whatever they want. But, you know, if there's a question about its accuracy, it's not helpful to the to the committee members. In addition, I personally do not do not care if people submit uh, publications from from uh, industry. Uh, sometimes industry has some very helpful viewpoints. As long as when someone does so, they alert us that it is an industry back group or an industry supported group, just so we have that context. Something was submitted. I did some Google searches related to one of the items, and I realized it was an industry back group. Um, and so it's not that I discounted what I read, but I read it with more context, <laughs> knowing that it was not a you know, a neutral, unbiased observer making these observations about, about artificial turf. So um, th those are my only cautionary notes. Submit whatever you want. We'll read it. We'll do our due diligence. It's just as more helpful if people provide things in the proper context to us. Anyone want to add anything else? I don't know. Or... Okay. Um, with that, keep moving.
uh working group updates we always now natasha you do the you know you help me with the agenda and you do this ordering so you know yeah. maybe one week you can mix it up but i'm perfectly fine with health going first <laughs> sure happy to um so jill and i were able to meet over the weekend and um we have started as i've mentioned before we we've started our um our sort of report, our written report, and um, we've started to plug in a lot of our resources. So uh, a lot of the research material, uh, Jill, and able, Jill and I were able to sort of sit down and, and decipher through and get them into buckets in terms of um, some of the conclusions that we're coming from or coming to, not even necessarily conclusions, but our research, um, plugging in where those, research, where those resources um, also line up. So we've been working... Um, pretty pretty well on that we feel like we've got a good um a good sort of base going there we have talked more and more about um some of our speakers i've reached out to a few different um folks and i i still have not you know been able to to reach who i who we would like to um and we are waiting to hear back from marvin but we should hear back from him this week so i'm really hopeful that we will have uh, a presenter to to bring forth um you know, within the next week or so. And I, Jill and I um, also spoke about sort of, uh, you know what, Jill, I'm, I'm drawing a little bit of a blank. I'm going to uh, punt to you a little bit if that's okay. <laughs> so I think the thing- Full Disclosure, we... I had um, COVID this week, so my brain's a little bit funky. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. The things we still are looking at balancing are understanding more about usability and access to playing and contrasting that with what is true PFAS and other chemical exposure. Um, and I was just looking through the 20 nanograms per liter is the drinking water levels per mass DEP, which actually is like a pretty low number. Some of the other states are much higher, but we don't have groundwater drinking in Arlington, or maybe, you know, there's a few people who do, but most people have municipal water. So I guess my question is, if you're being exposed through maybe swimming in the res or walking on a field, like what, what kind of exposure is that? And I think that goes back to what we're really looking for for a speaker. Um, if, you know, if we're not talking about drinking or consuming off of products that contain PFAS, what is the exposure that we're talking about and how, you know, what are the levels that are, I don't think safe is the right word, but acceptable. And we are having a hard time finding, um, I, I think I couldn't find anyone at Chan School of Public Health that has that kind of expertise. And it, it looks like we're trying to look a little bit at BU's public health. I also had yeah. a, sorry. Oh. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I, our group, we end up talking a little bit of PFAS in our group, not that it's necessarily in our in our bucket, but just because, you know, it, there was a comment made about PFAS. So we we talked about PFAS a little bit in our group. And I, I do think it's, Jill, your point is really important as we unpack this, because there's a lot of information on PFAS. And and also PFAS is not one thing. It's, it's you know, hundreds of things. And there are six things that, you know, been a focal point on PFAS, but there's, you know, my understanding is there's hundreds of things in the P, PFAS, PFOA, PFAS, you know, realm. Um, and there's a lot of information about what has PFAS and what doesn't, but, you know, the understanding I have through work on this committee and prior, prior work and other positions is that the most, the greatest concern about PFAS is drinking water. That's not to say other concerns aren't as, you know, aren't important. It's just, the focus has always been, the primary focus has always been on drinking water supply, contamination in the drinking water supply. Um, that is, in my opinion, and I, I'm open to disagreement if, if there is, that is not an issue in Arlington. We get our water from the MWRA, which gets its water from the Quabbin, which is, by all indications, by the annual testing they do, practically pristine when it comes to, to PFAS. Um, so, that's not to say that PFAS can't run off into brooks and rivers and, you know, contaminate things for fish and wildlife and 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 other areas, you know, the res, uh, which would be a concern. But, you know, the greatest concern is drinking water. And that's just not unless someone's drinking from a well in Arlington and maybe there's a few people who have private wells. Um, that's not an issue in Arlington. 
Um, so, you know, sort of is separating out the PFAS issues and the various PFAS and the PFAS concerns can take a lot of work. And I don't envy the work of the health and environmental groups in doing that. But I don't know. I hope I haven't said anything controversial. I, I don't think I have. Well, but I think I think it adds to like, what are the comparable communities? And last time we were talking about Malden being densely populated on MWRA water. Whereas like a Martha's Vineyard really probably does have different concerns. Mm -hmm. I can imagine Martha's Vineyard probably has a significant amount of, of well water that is used for drinking. Um, yes. So, so I think really, if we can get a person to understand what are the sources other than drinking water and Teflon pans that allow this chemical to infiltrate the body and what are we talking about for levels? Because if you look at some of the data that was sent to us in those various testing sites, the levels were levels that would be problematic in drinking water, um, but we're not talking about drinking water. Um, and I think, and the environmental group, I think is gonna have different issues, but as far as the health group goes, that's the real question to me is, is how is this entering our body? And I got to thinking today, we may want to look at something like age and, and who has priority if we are to have turf surfaces. And maybe it is the littlest kids that aren't playing on the field because they may be the most likely to like take with them <laughs> some of the materials and, and ingest them. But I think when we're talking about older kids, um, there's probably little in the way of ingestion. So what can they get through falling on the field or um, just simply playing in the area. Can I pause the discussion for a second? Natasha, I've gotten a text from a few people who say they can't get into the meeting. Not not members, but members of the public. Really? They said the meeting's locked or it's saying the meeting's locked. Uh, okay, this is a technical difficulty. Um, I'm, I try and go into the settings here. I don't exactly know everything I'm doing. I, uh, there are people from the public that have gotten in, so. Yeah. I, I will try and work on this piece. I don't know what this. Do they have the right uh, it's connection to you? Are they, yeah. They should uh, because it, we've been using the same. Yeah. There. Yeah. There's no password that you need to use. It should just come right in mm -hmm. the town. No. We did switch uh, from one Zoom account to another, but it's been several. It's been a few weeks since we've done I that. Said, so yeah, mm -hmm. this person said clicked on link on our committee web page and Off getting a message yeah. getting getting message unable to join meeting host has locked the meeting okay let me uh see how i can get into the settings here sorry i didn't mean to break the nope, flow it's but, okay i uh... um mike i know you want to get in on this discussion just very briefly um i think what you're saying about water supply is true that uh we get our water from the MWRA. And I think to, to that extent, it's irrelevant for this committee's work uh, about drinking water because we're focusing on playing fields. Mm -hmm. and so I'm not sure why even the, the issue of drinking water is, is, is being considered here. I'm yeah, and you know, it, it, and that's an important, really important point, Mike, mm -hmm. because when you, you know, I've been reading a lot about Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket and Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, the drinking water concern was a huge issue in those communities because they aren't MWRA communities. They are getting, you know, especially in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, mm -hmm. they already had PFAS issues related to their airports and, you know, the firefighter foam and, and they had and already had things leaching in. And so, you know, they only have limited water supply and if it gets right. contaminated, they're, they're in trouble. Yeah. Same with Portsmouth where there, so it's not to say that I'm not trying to diminish the issues that those communities were facing. It's just not our issue here. We have, right. may have other issues with PFAS, but right. the drinking, you know, things running off and getting into our drinking water supply isn't going to be one of them. And we can thank the MWRA for that, I guess, for doing a good job of keeping no, it. I just was curious to know why that even came up, because we're not looking at drinking water issues in this committee, as far as I know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Jill maybe can explain. It was again. it was in the, the information that was sent out in the packet. Yeah. And what, you know, what I was looking at is first like, OK, these fields are are 
leaching PFAS. But then what I realized is all of those communities that were looking at it, drinking water was a concern for them. And all of the regulations, we don't have, there's not regulations of like how much PFAS okay. could be in the environment. It's how much PFAS can be in your drinking water. Yes. So that really seems to be the only regulation. Jim, um, I'm sorry to interrupt Jill. I'm so sorry. I, I did touch something on the settings here. So anything that may have been locked before has been unlocked. I don't know how that happened, mm -hmm. but hopefully that will, these folks can get in. So if you're getting uh, messages, Jim, ask them to, to try again, if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. Now I'm getting two people. I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt. Just that's all right. And it said the town calendar entry is is the way to go. I will check in with um, those folks as well. Okay. 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 Good. I see some other folks. So. Yeah. Good. I'm not sure I what happened there. One one other thought on the drinking water issue I re recognize is not an issue for Arlington, but we do have neighboring communities that have their own water systems. And given the topography, I don't think we're probably having much impact on them, but, you know, both Cambridge and uh, Winchester have, you know, their own, well, I think Winchester is a hybrid, but, you know, some of their own water supply and have surface reservoirs, um, you know, that are within the, within those communities. So again, it's not an Arlington issue and it, I don't, probably not really a issue for those communities either, like I said, given the topography, but it is something to think about that we're not, not everybody in Eastern Massachusetts is on MWA water. That's a good point, Joe. Really good point. And I think as what Jill was saying, just maybe I'll try to bridge Mike's comment and Jill's comment. I, I think the reason why we sometimes do bring up drinking water is it is the, even though it's not relevant in this case, is because it is the most quantifiable thing the federal government and the state government has done to sort of say danger levels. Whereas in other PFAS contamination issues, it's a little vaguer as to, you know, was this what you were getting at, Joe? Maybe it, maybe I'm not, but like, yeah. it's not as clear that if you like bathe in PFAS, what that's doing to you. You know, I mean, what I usually read is like taking a shower. If there's PFAS in the water in your shower, like that's not necessarily good, but it's not necessarily going to affect you, or at least we don't know how much it affects you. Whereas with drinking water, you drink a glass of water that's above the standards put out there. We We've been told that that's bad. So I don't know. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but that's... Am I kind of where you were on this, Joe? Okay. Yeah. And I think Joe brings up a good point is that if we're going to end up with site specific conversations, there are, I would imagine that, you know, Fresh Pond being the backup reservoir, we would have to look at something like Thorndike and is there any, yeah. is there any contamination? Whereas other places I think are probably much farther away. Mm -hmm. um, so we certainly don't want to dismiss our neighboring communities. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Thank you, Health. You're busy. And when Marvin comes back, he's going to be back with a full head of steam, I have a feeling. So um, I don't want to break the flow, but you mentioned guest speakers. You know, we had sort of said the 6th and the 13th would be potential times for guest speakers. That doesn't mean some other date, if someone's really available on some other date or future Tuesday, we couldn't find a way to fit them in. Um, and it seems like right now, even though we're talking to a bunch of people, I don't know how realistic next Tuesday is. So I mean, maybe the 13th is more realistic at this point, you know, giving people at least two weeks notice. Um, and we can talk about scheduling in our next meeting at the end of this one, but, um, but I guess I'll move to the safety update now. Um, so, um, so I think, you know, our group met, uh, today, we usually meet, meet, uh, on Tuesday, Tuesday at noon. Um, and Joe, uh, Leslie and I had a good conversation sort of talking through one of the things Joe's been taking a deep dive on, and it's sort of related to our work and sort of important to our work, not necessarily in our charge, but it was something Joe had wanted to kind of take a deep dive on was, the maintenance and cost issues, you know, what's the cost of installation, what's the cost of maintenance, and what's the comparison between the two. And although it's not directly part of our charge, it, it's relevant to our charge. And I'm glad Joe's kind of doing the deep dive. And I had shared with him the 2016 Tory analysis, 
Now, granted, it's 2016. It's, you know, well, nearly eight years old now. And, um, but Joey sort of used that as a guide and then compared it to some of the numbers from recent installations or cost estimates we've gotten. So Joe's keeping very busy with some of, some of this stuff. And, um, and uh, it's very helpful, I think, as he's looking at that. But Leslie, what else are we kind of, I don't want to do all the talking. What else have we been talking about in our group? <laughs> I'm going to let you do a, say a few words. <laughs> well, <laughs> or more than just, a few words. Yeah. Uh, well, just looking at, you know, the, the organic maintenance as well and what the costs are relative to that. Um, because even though it's kind of apples to oranges, you know, we're, we're not doing the organic turf maintenance now, even if we were to go to organic turf maintenance, I mean, we can see what those costs are and what the um, impacts of those are, but that's really a natural turf to natural turf comparison. That's really comparing what we do today with our fields uh, to what we could potentially do um, to natural turf fields, but it really doesn't impact usage. You know, even if you move to an organic turf management plan, you still can't get on the fields if it's been, you can't get on our natural grass fields if it's been raining and in the early spring with the with the amount of snow that we have so you know we can look at what those costs are and what the what it would take to to get to that but it's kind of irrelevant to what it would take to do artificial turf maintenance that kind of stands well, alone and we've been talking about trying to find somebody and we have a few good leads yeah um, of someone who has worked in both uh, grass turf um, uh, installation and maintenance, as well as artificial turf installation and maintenance. Someone who's done both, <laughs> is knowledgeable about both, um, and can also speak to the, the pros and the cons of both, and can speak to how you know they've worked with various communities on, um, you know doing kind of better maintenance of grass fields while also, you know, uh, you know, what the drawbacks or benefits of that are versus installation of artificial and maintenance of artificial turf. And we actually have a few candidates we've identified through some, some media and public sources that we're going to try to see if we can maybe get you know, one of these folks to come and speak to us. Someone who, I, you know, presumably doesn't come to this with biases. They work with both, um, and have helped communities with both, but may be able to be a good resource to us in sort of an unbiased way, explaining why some communities go one way and some communities go the other and the costs and, and you know, can also speak to, you know, uh, injury and what they see in terms of injuries with either, you know, or both. Um, so we've actually have, I don't want to say their names yet because, they, you know, we may not be able to get them, but we've identified at least one and maybe potentially two or three people who might fit the fit the bill there and I think would be good not just to address the safety part but also could address some issues that the other uh, working groups might might have so yeah they're so in the mind yeah yeah well, I, when I spoke to Dan Martin at MIT I mean they have both turf and grass and he said they spend about eight thousand or ten thousand dollars a year on maintenance for turf and about 150 thousand a year on maintenance for grass now they have about two to three times as much probably grass as they do turf, but I mean I'm ha and I'm happy to reach back out to them and sort of solidify those numbers if that's helpful. But I mean they they obviously have both and and maintain both, so that's you know that's a sort of real life example of what they what they tend to spend. That's which is probably more than we would be able to spend. Yeah, it's more, but I mean as a but percentage, I mean Joe's I think Joe's oh. data is not necessarily inconsistent with that i mean the numbers right. may be different but that there's yes that it probably is consistent with what joe the numbers he's gathering from various sources yeah. well, i think including our, really... numbers, including, yeah. know, our own numbers for what we're yeah. spending today here in you know again we have the experience of having both types of fields 
Yeah, I think Joe's the information from MIT could be very helpful in terms of just comparing uh, what they've shown, what they've been doing. I think that'd be helpful for us in terms of cost. You know, and, and I'll remind folks who are listening, you know, we know the costs are not, they're not the main event here, right? But it, it's still, I think town meeting when we make a final report would still appreciate, you know, an analysis mm -hmm. of, Part of the equation. It's part of the equation. You know, um, for some people, it may be a lesser part of the equation. For some people, it may be a greater part. So we think we should include it. And to the extent Joe and other either of our Joes have been able to put some time into this, I, I think it's worth including, provided, you know, we get we get it right. And I think we will with the two Joes working on it. So, um, Leslie, I have a yeah. question for you. Yeah. If we were to move towards organically maintained turf fields that are not mud pits like some of the fields we have now would a component of that be less hours of play to make that work like do they have to be used for only a certain amount of time a day i think that's a question we need an expert to answer you know i mean i think we could we could shake the we, bushes ourselves but yeah i mean based on our based on our experience i mean actual turf is whether it's wet or you can put the little kids like to going back to the conversation that we had a while ago um about you know ages little kids going out on a grass field aren't going to cause the type of wear that you're going to get from the older athletes and kids at the high school level or you know that are more serious and any field any grass field is going to be damaged if it gets enough use when it's vulnerable when it's wet um which is not the case with i mean that's why you know we we talk a lot about when in the spring uh, teams can actually go out onto the fields and it's so dependent on the New England weather and <coughs> what type of um, weather we have so seasonally the actual sports teams season starts in mid-March but we can't let our athletes out onto the field generally in mid-March because they're too vulnerable. Um, whether the, the whether the field is maintained as it is today, or it's maintained organically, it's still grass, and there's it's still uh, subject to damage if it's used when wet. It doesn't. Artificial turf doesn't have the same limitations that grass fields have. I mean, that's that's just the nature of the field. Yeah, and MIT said that it's more about that, like how much use they can get in the spring and in the late yeah. fall versus yeah. like necessarily, and I think Joe Connolly said this last week as well, sort of more use Yes. like day to day. It's more about starting earlier and maybe going a little bit later. And you can also, I guess, if you do it right, you can plow a turf field in a way that you can't with a natural turf field. Although, again, if you don't do it right, you can just rip the field up. You can rip the field up. But I have seen I have seen um, fields in use in New Hampshire in February, March, with snow mounds piled up on either side. Um, you, you can get snow off of an artificial turf field yep. without damaging the field. Um, and it's playable. And it, they're not damaged as long as you, as you say, plow it right. That is the issue around here. Are those shoulder seasons, you know, the, the, the March and into September to November when you're trying to be outside and, and on the fields, but the grass fields are very fragile, especially in the spring. They're fragile. And doing damage at that time can cause years of um, 
trying to trying to fix them. And and I think anyone's you know anyone that's gone to our fields can see the wear at the gold mouths, or if you're um, if you've gone and, and looked at lacro at uh, lacrosse games, the the face off circles. You can see where the wear happens, and that's just as a result of natural uh, play and and natural patterns. And we've tried to rotate fields so that those wear patterns happen differently. Um, you know, but we don't always have the capacity to do that because our we don't have you know, 100, one, not 100% of our rectangular fields cannot be rotated into a different configuration. We're very, we're limited um, in, in our space and the way that our fields are configured or can be configured. Um, I mean, when we look at Poets Corner and the, and the way it's uh, crowned and, and, it, and the, the sloping sides, you have to consider that you can't just do any type of um, field game there because it's going to end up going onto the access road. You know, balls are going to go onto the access roads. So, you know, our fields are, are not, you know, if you were going to pick the locations for fields, some of our locations are not where you would necessarily pick. They're a result of our fields having been landfills that we turned into parks and, and fields. Um, yeah. So that's just so, the, the condition of where we're at. Yeah. And I think that that was one of the reasons that I thought Malden was an intriguing example because it's very, you know, they have a very similar demographic and a similar problem and what they were, you know, trying to, what they are doing with one of their fields um, went through a lot of the decision making that, that we're looking at now. Leslie, can I just ask a quick question? That Malden case, are they taking a an existing artificial turf field and making no. it? It's so it's a grass that they're converting, or just a space? A space. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was a park a playing field, but it was it was grass, and and there were some contamination issues. Yep. And they're going to artificial turf. Yes. Yes. On Mal one, in on Malden, one, on one field at least. One, yeah, on this one field. They're in the which, process you know, which, of which doing used it. To and be they went a, through a process yeah. of, you know, very similar process, decision-making process. There's a, a study on that. Sorry. Um, we could go on and on, I think, Leslie and I. Um, we have, <laughs> like, we have, we have very good meetings, um, but I think we'll turn it over to environmental. Thank you. Um, Yes, yeah, so the environmental group has uh, made some progress, I'm glad to report, that we are uh, at this point narrowing our bullet points, the areas that we are going to focus on to, I think, four, maybe five particular topics that are of concern to, uh, to the environment, the environmental issues. And uh, I'll point out that uh, they, uh, I could relay them to you at this point, but I think it's more important for me to say that uh, we also are looking at several speakers. And I did want to address the speaker issue. Yeah. Uh, that um, uh, one question is, are we going to have one speaker from each subgroup or more? Are we going to have a question and answer session primarily? with a very brief introduction from the speaker, or what's the format of that going to be, uh, and how much time are we going to take? So those are a couple of questions about speakers. I guess I'd say, you get the speaker, we'll figure it out. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, sometimes speakers want to know things ahead of time, and I get that, but I guess, you know, we can be very flexible. It, it, you know, I mean, I envision that they would do a short presentation um, followed by q and from from the group uh, but their presentation could also be in the in the scheme of like mike maybe you you know having a little bit of a back and forth with them to get some information out and then opening up to the larger group i well my my thinking or what we talked about is that um 
uh, in particular for university people that we've been in touch with, professors and so forth, uh, it's it's a hard time in the semester for them to prepare anything. And given the uh, experience we had in the town meeting where people felt frustrated that they couldn't get a full answer to some of their questions, uh, we thought it might make sense for us to do like a three to five minute introduction to who this person is and what their expertise is, and then just let the committee ask specific questions about that area of expertise. Uh, and I don't know if we're going to take half an hour for Q&A or whatever it may be, but, um, uh, you know, that might be an easier way to get uh, informed uh, experts into, into the process. I don't know if Joe or Claire have any other issues or comments they want to make on that. So go right ahead. Nothing on the speakers, I think. Um... You know, we, you and I had talked, Mike, about um, how how it's been a, a little bit difficult to find, um, uh, you know, um, speakers and letting them know what the specifics uh, are. I like, I, I really do like Joe's um, idea of maybe bringing in um, the MIT, um, the the gentleman that you spoke with at MIT, potentially about um, field maintenance and um, you know how they how they manage it how they manage it over there. I think um, you know we did we did have an opportunity to talk about speakers and and how we how we might want to bring one in. Um, we also had an opportunity to talk a little bit about bullet points about some stuff that we wanted to include in the reports. And I think you know where I can be useful here is to look at some of our our um, uh, plans, our existing plans, our hazard mitigation hazard mitigation plan, our climate action plan, things like that. Um, and how they relate back to, you know, this environmental group and, you know, sort of um, what at least in the formation of those plans, the community was really um, focused on, you know, things like heat island effects, things like um, impermeable surface. And I don't know, you know, very recently, one of the things I uh, heard and Mike and I spoke about this a little bit on the phone was that um, the, we're, we're starting to see um, uh, at least one government organization is calling, you know, artificial turf fields now impermeable surface, which has a whole slew of um, stormwater impact, um, runoff impact, um, and how that will be classified in the, you know, in the future moving forward. Um, I think, you know, we were also talked a little bit about, um, you know, uh, the, the climate work that this office and other uh, areas, other groups in town have done, um, looking at carbon sequestration in, green fields, um, you know, we have be given the limited, limited space, the limited open space we have in Arlington, um, what an impact may be of, you know, potentially replacing um, one of those green fields with, with an artificial uh, uh, surface. Um, and also, again, the runoff considerations, you know, um, kids don't always play just on fields all the time. They also play in the Millbrook. They play um, in all, many other green spaces in town that could be impacted, you know, by, by runoff by, you know, um, some of these other issues um, that we've been talking about a little bit. So I think, you know, um, where I'm going to uh, turn my focus is, um, you know, and in, into, you know, as I can be useful, into our published plans, into, you know, some of the um, goals that, that have, have come out of those um, and and um, looking at how we might um, rectify or, re or reconcile, excuse me, um, you know, um, the, the the turf conversation with the with the organic field conversation. There are issues with organic fields too. I mean, over fertilization, we have over uh, you know, over uh, nutri nutrient, uh, I, I guess, in some of our um, in some of our water bodies, which have led to algal blooms. And you know, it's all very very complex. You know, and and I think um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things to talk about on on either side. But but this is really the direction that we're going in looking, um, I think, mostly at runoff of the infill runoff of PFAS and other chemicals, um, how this relates back to, you know, some of our published plans. And then, of course, you know, in the broader um, context of, of just climate in general. So, Yeah, and I would just add, I would just add that in terms of um, the uh, various topics, I think that the runoff is an issue primarily for our water bodies and wetlands that are uh, protected under the State Wetland Protection Act, as well as our own bylaw in Arlington. So that's one area, obviously, that we're gonna be looking at. 
And the other issue is um, the one of infill, and there is runoff and migration of the infill, and what's the impact of that? <clears throat> uh, you know, and then the whole issue of climate change, and we've got uh, PFAS that are not only in water, but in the blades of grass themselves and in other areas, and what's the impact of that on players? But that's that's a health and safety issue rather than an environmental issue. But it does have environmental uh, effect given the, the if there are water bodies or wetlands nearby. So those are some some of the concerns. And then of course is the recycling issue. As far as I'm concerned, there is zero recycling going on of artificial turf in this country, and these rolled up uh, uh, rolls of uh, turf just sort of sit there and that can't be good for any anybody yeah i mean you know it's these fun, issues it's funny on that one you know you on a lot of these things it's sort of you get differing opinions but on that point mike there seems to be no no debate that they've not yet found i mean i know there's some chatter that there's some some path to recycling but i mean realistically i don't think any of these things can be recycled and i haven't seen anything to tell me otherwise Right, and that's uh, uh, you know part of the problem is the various chemicals, and part of it is the infills that leak out and all of that. So there's <laughs> there's a lot of issues, and what as I mentioned, we're going to try to nail down just four or five specific topics for the environmental group can look at as part of our report, and uh, when we finalize those, I'd be glad to circulate them to this committee uh, for their you know, for any input. So that's, you know, it, it, there's, you can, you can go on for years looking at this stuff uh, and there's always new stuff coming out. As I mentioned before, one of the things that we don't see is any impact studies on the newer stuff, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, wood or, or cork. Brock or, fill. Yeah, Brock, Brock fill. fill or any of those things. Uh, there's not... Um, there's just not a lot of detail that I found telling us anything about that. Yeah. I guess um, one question. Which I, suppose is, which I suppose is better than <laughs> all the negative material on uh, crumb rubber, which, you know, doesn't seem to have very, very positive things going for it. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, some of that is if there's not an issue, there's not a study in some cases. Because or, there's nothing to yeah, study right. because there is no there is no negativity around it. It seems like most of the studying is is the push for, you know, what harm are we doing? And when it comes to how are we doing things well, well, you're not gonna bother to study something that you're that you if you've solved the problem. Yeah, the problem is that you don't know if there's a problem until you study it. <laughs> um, right I, I will say i did see it i i don't want to engage with the chat but I, I i will simply say this i saw a comment in the chat that said that the carpet can be recycled i would love to see if you have something that says that i would love to see it i'd love to um, see some I, reports on that that'd be really good yeah I, i'm not questioning it it's more i haven't seen anything to that effect so if someone has evidence that the carpet Part can be recycled. I'm all ears and eyes. Um, I guess one question, just in general for speakers, um, a couple of the recommendations I've gotten have been for uh, sort of landscape architecture consultants who do field design, um, and they probably know a lot and probably get a lot of the same questions from communities that we're trying to answer, but I just wanted to make sure that, or see if there was any concerns about having sort of those types of consultants be one of our, speak one of our speakers. I think if they can speak to both, you know, the natural, the the grass turf and the artificial, I don't see a problem with that. I don't know if others do. Okay, uh, just wanted to double check. I am cognizant of the fact that I think Joe, you have to leave at six. Uh, yeah, I do. Okay, um, so just one other comment, or just one other thing to mention: they did meet with um, someone from Mass Municipal Association who who had. A recommendation for someone from Weston and Sampson, I think, has done work for the town in the past. Um, as a you know, who seem who I think to Natasha's point has has sort of worked on a variety of fields, so isn't like a oh yeah, no, I think Weston's 
<laughs> one or the other, crazy. but more like just a proponent of, you know, yeah. getting themselves more work. But anyway, um, but they'll do whatever you want. Um, and then also she did mention the person from, I forget, I'm blanking on her name, um, Josie, um, mentioned that sh- there's a, they think that both the state and the federal government may be issuing new, well, the f- federal government, I think we knew is, was looking at issuing regulations related to PFAS, which could impact that, but there's also talk of state legislation that potentially would, you know, regulate this more, which, you know, not, not artificial turf specifically, but it could result in impacts on the ability to use artificial turf. So she just wanted to make sure we were aware of that and she was going to let me know if there was any further developments in that. I had a question for the environmental group and I don't know if you've come across anything, but if we're, if, if you're converting a, a field playing surface itself to turf, are you able to include more trees um, and foliage nearby as sort of like a, like a trade-off because, you know, you're not requiring sunlight and you're not requiring as much water. Um, so, so is there the possibility that the overall landscape can be positive in a way? And, and uh, have you come across anything? I haven't seen anything about that, uh, but it's, it's an interesting idea, but I don't know how much uh, encroachment you want to have from roots uh, into the, or the area near the artificial turf. Um, but it, it's an interesting idea for sure. I haven't heard about it. Yeah, I mean, that probably would, I mean, that, that could be a question that someone, like a landscape, landscape yeah, architect that, that was would help us think through or answer. Would- it's good design. It would be good design to do it that way for sure. Um, I'm just going to keep things moving. I think it's been a really good discussion. Uh, uh, to unfortunately, my, I have so many screens open on my laptop. I missed. I think our next point is Natasha. What is our next item? It's about format template. Yep. Sorry, yeah. I'm I'm uh, recording structure needed. and template. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, so I know um, I sort of promised something by this meeting, and I know Mike had sent um, an idea to me that the environmental group was kicking around. I, I guess I'm going to be a little more laissez-faire on this one, and start off by saying I care a little less about the format and more about the content. Having said that, you know, if if there's a format that works for a particular sub, you know, subgroup working group to put out their information on I'm I'm at this at this stage at least very willing to kind of go with it having said that uh, you know to the extent we're looking for some kind of rough structure for each of these sections I would say you know something like brief introduction you know this is these are the issues we're looking at but this is the you know where this is you know this is you know the issues that the environmental subgroup looked at or the health group looked at, or the safety group looked at. Um, and then, you know, maybe break it down. So if you say, you're going to, you know, I'm just throwing this out here, but safety group, you know, we said, you know, injuries, um, you know, heat. Uh, Joe sent us something good, and I can't remember it, honestly, but he had like injuries, and then he broke down by certain injuries, uh, heat issues, he broke that down, and then the last was sort of playing surface um, on athlete, you know, the difference between turf and artificial turf in terms of the actual playing surface and the effect on the athletes. That may not be exactly how we're doing it, but, you know, let's go with that for now. And then you'd have, you know, your first heading would be after some introductory words about this is what we looked into, we feel these are the major issues within this topic area you know, issue one, um, sports injuries, you know, issue two, uh, you know, and then lay it all out there. And as part of laying it out there, discuss the issue, discuss the sources you look to. I mean, you can explicitly discuss the sources or you can simply discuss and footnote the sources. I'll leave that up to however you want to get the information out there and then sort of walk, I think, walk the reader methodically through each of the areas you looked at and each of the sort of was you know uh, you know findings you you developed from what you looked at and then at the end at the end well before you get to sort of your subgroups findings and recommendations i would advise that the group should also and you can have a separate heading for this or you can incorporate it 
folding it into each of the discussions, but some discussion about mitigation. So if you recognize that there is an inherent problem with artificial turf on that particular, you know, so for example, I think I'm not giving away much by saying, you know, we have recognized that there is a heat issue uh, on the player, you know, on the user uh, on artificial turf. I think we would definitely, though, be derelict if we didn't get into that. We believe that the, many of those issues could be mitigated through, you know, limiting the hours of use during certain summer days, summer weeks, um, the hours of use, certain, you know, pro protocols for people who do use the field, you know, things like that. And you could either lump all of your mitigation into one heading, subheading within your area, or you can just effortlessly fold it into each discussion whatever whatever works best for you and i think that's kind of roughly the format you were suggesting mike maybe maybe i'm maybe i'm maybe i'm off but i kind of I, I think that's true and i think that one area that i think we all have is here's what we don't know or what we didn't study or what we couldn't yeah. find out about that needs further investigation yeah i mean we we are not going to answer every question about art, artificial turf or regular turf so if there's an area where it's like well we could only get so you know we could only and i think obvious among that is we would have liked more studies about you know uh different non crumb rubber infills you know i, I would have liked more studies about how you know brock fill or coconut husks or whatever you know and their effects on you know heat or this or that um you know, we have some industry data on that. I mean, that's helpful, but it's still industry data. So, you know, if there's an area where you just came up short because we couldn't find, you know, then then I think Mike's right. Just put it out there and say, you know, we got as far as we could on, on this subject or that. And this was where we, you know, there's a gap. Yeah, I think that's important for people to realize when they're reading our report uh, that uh, there's a lot more out there than we had time or ability to uh, actually deal with. And I think they will appreciate that. Yes. So, you know, the bullet, I mean, so th this may matter not as much doing bullets, which I think what you were saying would be due by a week from Friday. Um, I mean, the bullets, you can sort of have a match the rough, you know, sort of almost be in an outline format, but I don't really want an outline. Um, I want some substance behind. I mean, the idea of the bullets is you're going to start to show some substance behind. But, you know, one sentence can do, you know, something that may be a full paragraph later on can be one sentence now, you know, roughly, you know, sort of a thesis sentence for each of, you know, each of the kind of points you're going to be making. Um, I'm guessing that's what folks are doing. I mean, in some ways, I, I think some groups, maybe the health group, already would like to jump into the narrative part and i feel bad but the, maybe the bullet points is this you know uh, holding you back a little bit but i do feel like it's helpful just to give the larger committee a sense of just where you're going with this and if we you know if the people are concerned for any reason about where the bullets are maybe it's a better point to have that discussion now than before you've written a whole section and we tell you well, okay that's no not where we wanted you to go with this so um so are people generally sort of, I mean, I'm I'm trying not to be too prescriptive here about how how you do this. Uh, I mean, it'd be nice if we had, you know, things sort of flowing in a general kind of mm -hmm. format like that. But I just don't want to be like, well, you know, you have to have, you know, the Harvard outline here and it's going to have, you know, A, B, Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, you know, like ultimately there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of formatting work done by Natasha and myself, you know, at the end of this project. So right now it's the ideas are the most important thing. So a week from this coming Friday, a week from the second, I guess it is. Um, yeah. So is that something you want us to send to you and Natasha or just to the whole committee? So just start with Natasha. Yeah, go ahead. I Natasha. was just going to say um, Friday for the deadline, that's perfectly fine but it would have to be first thing in the morning because I have to get this packet out and I have to get it posted by 12 noon because it's it's beyond me <laughs> and the people who post it really only work until 12 noon but we have to have it posted by 5 p.m on Friday to be in compliance with open meeting law so it does put us in a little bit of a, a bind so if we could get it by Friday morning 
Um, and then that way it can be incorporated into, or if you can get it to me earlier than that, that would be great mm -hmm. because I try to have everything all teed up, but I do have to have it over. Um, I would so say you want these bullet points for our next meeting is what you're saying, basically. No, right? not next week. No, no, no. Just, you know, shortly after our next meeting. Yes. Ah, okay. Cause I thought you wanted them, you know, by this Friday. No, no, oh. next Friday. Oh, next oh, Friday. okay, got yeah. it. Yeah, no, 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 I don't think I can get mine done that <laughs> quickly. I, I was just <laughs> asking. Um, so that leads to a, I think we've discussed, you know, subject matter experts, yeah. which is, I think the next time on the agenda, I think we've already sort of discussed yeah. that. In terms of scheduling, I guess maybe I'll, I'll fold this into new business. There's... There's an option we have. One option is to not have a meeting next Tuesday because it's sort of crunch time for our first deliverable. And just if if working groups want to meet during that slot, we know that they have it open. Um, they can, or just people can plow away and working, you know, individually on whatever tasks they're doing related to the bullet points. Um, we can meet uh, next Tuesday as well, especially if, you know, I, I we most disinclined to cancel a meeting if we had a guest speaker who was like yes that's the date i can do it and that's the only date i can do it then we would i would say we should have the meeting but given that people are still working on nailing things down and probably it may not come together by next tuesday again i'll open up to the group but natasha and i were thinking it might just be a better use of our time to really get into the work part and then really have a full full meeting the following tuesday where we unpack the first deliverable so you know we're not talking about we're talking about potentially as for discussion, canceling next Tuesday's meeting and then having a deliverable that Friday and then having a really, really, you know, potentially long meeting the following Tuesday. Or just meeting both Tuesdays and still, still sticking with the original plan. Uh huh. I think Joe had to uh, jump off, but I Joe do see. I think off. he's. Yeah. I think he's yeah. on. He might be on his um, cell phone, just kind of listening in. So, I guess. Yeah, I'm um, listening on my phone. So. Yep. Sorry, Joe. Thanks. No <laughs> um, just wanted to acknowledge that. So I think we just need to make a decision at this point. Do we want to meet next week, or do we want to leave this as an opportunity for the subgroups to meet and sort of finalize our next big thing? Is is sort of deadline? So I'm not sure. You know, do we have more that we want to discuss as a group here, or mm -hmm. is the next discussion point really talking about what what we've outlined in our in our sections? Um, I would feel I'll just speak for myself. I'll, I would feel fine if we did not meet as a larger group next week and that we focused on our reporting. Um, but I will do whatever I'm available. More to the extent, if people are really hungry for a meeting, have us have one of their working group meetings at that time. Right. Well, I think it's yeah, I feel like. That would be doing a doing a working group meeting instead might be more the most effective use of our time. Yeah, and I think that once those um, outlines or bullet points or whatever you call them or have been submitted, then we're going to have a I would assume a full meeting to discuss each of them. Yeah, yeah and then I mean just so everyone knows, with the tight timeline, there's only two weeks from one deliverable to the next, so. Um, you know, I guess the tension is that if we have a bunch of guest speakers on the 13th, we're probably not having a real opportunity to discuss our work on that date, which is fine. We can add, an, I mean, if we have to, we can add another meeting date in there somewhere. Um, it's just, I don't, I'm hesitant to like, I mean, we all want guest speakers and we'd like to have them, but I'm, I'm hesitant to sort of block off meetings if some for some reason they don't come and then that time could have been better used on the actual work. So Jim, do you think that maybe we should leave the the opportunity on the table and make a decision a little bit later on in the week? If anyone has any yeah. guest speakers that they want to bring for next week, we can certainly move forward. That's a great idea. Why don't we say, if you've yeah. nailed down a speaker and the date that they can really do it is next Tuesday, let us know by Thursday evening. Yeah. And we'll keep the date open. We'll have the meeting. Um, but if if we're not seeing any speakers nailed down by next to you know for next Tuesday by by Thursday night, then our default will be that we will take down the meeting and working groups will use that time 
or any time early next week to really get the first deliverable ready. Right. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, any other about... any other new business? And uh, I do want to thank um, Susan Stamps for posting uh, the charge in the chat. I think we we all know it very well, but it's always good to get another reminder of what our charge is. I think we've been really trying to hit all those points in our work, but as you actually start to put pen to paper, it's uh, it's good to just keep it in mind. There's and as always, else. as yeah. always, if there's additional, uh, you know, concerns or or things that you'd like the group to consider, please um, feel free to send an email to boh at town.arlington, and we can get those incorporated into our our meeting uh, packets. And thanks to Winnell as well. Yeah. 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 There's nothing else. I'll entertain a motion. motion. So moved. Sure. Your second, Leslie made the motion. Mike, are you seconding? Perfect. Um, okay. Well then, Natasha, we'll do we'll do the quick roll then. Okay, Mike. Yep. Okay, uh, Leslie. Yep. Uh, Joe Barr, if you're here. Yep. Okay. Uh, Jill. Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. Natasha. Yes. Marvin is absent. Jim. Yes. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay. I know a lot of work is happening here and behind the scenes right now as you're doing pulling together these bullets. And I just want to thank you all that we're it's a lot of work in a short time, but this group's really stepping up. So thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Bye.